Finally, we've Mary McAuliffe, who's going to be speaking to us on May Connolly, and we saw some of the newsreels earlier. And so the title of her paper is May Connolly Punished, Gendered Violence Against Women and Visual Propaganda During the War of Irish War of Independence. Um, and Mary's a historian and director of the Gender Studies Programme at UCD and holds a PhD from the School of History and Humanities, Trinity College Dublin. And her latest publications include uh, as co-editor with Miriam Houghton and Emily Pine, Legacies of the Magdalene Laundries, Commemoration, Gender and the Post-Colonial Carceral State for Manchester University Press, and that's 2021. Uh, she was also co-editor of Sexual Politics in Modern Ireland, and currently she's working on a book on gender and sexual violence during the Irish Revolutionary Period from 1919 to 23, to be published in late 20, 2023. And she's past president of the Women's History Association of Ireland, and is on the advisory board of the Irish Association of Professional Historians, and is a member of the Humanities Institute in UCD. Uh, so welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and thank you, Kieran. That was really interesting. I, I had not seen some of those shots at all. Just waiting for the mm -hmm. thing to come up. Yeah, I, I am not a film historian. I'm a gender historian, so I will be kind of going back and forth from mm. from different things. But really, looking, centering in then on this one clip. And is that ready to be played? When I, when I yeah, if you want to. Play it, you all right. Um, yeah. Just checking this. Okay, um, so it's great to be here today, and uh, I'm sorry I missed the talks this morning, uh, but uh, students questioning the results of their exams. Have to be <laughs> like that. Um, so in her 1964, I feel uh, see this is the problem of being a shorty. I'm <laughs> move out this way. In her 1964 memoir, Cork Common Mon member Lil Conlon noted that when the British authorities began to recognise the importance of common among women to the guerrilla warfare uh, effort that was going on, uh, she, she said, the going was tough on the female sex. They were constantly subjected to having their homes raided and their precious possessions destroyed. To intensify the raid of terror, swoops were made at night, entries forced into their homes and the women's hair cut off in brutal fashion, as well as suffering other insults and indignities. And what I want to talk about here today is uh, the use of the war on women or the, the, the terror on women during this period, particularly hair cropping, as propaganda and prop, uh, counter propaganda during the War of Independence, particularly. As, Con as Conlon acknowledged here, common among women were targeted, but so too were other women who were not necessarily in common among These women were targeted as part of the boycott against policemen. Women, uh, people were encouraged not to socialize with RIC men or black and tans or even speak to them. Girls who consorted with them were warned off or punished by having their hair cut off. Attacking young women for company keeping with the, uh, as it was called, with the Crown forces, with the intent of terrorizing them into behavior acceptable for a respectable Irish woman was an integral part of Republican surveillance and control of the civilian population. In my own research to date, using various archives, including news media, uh, newspapers, visual media, uh, etc., I've built a database of close to 250 individual instances of forcible hair cropping between late 1919. The first one is in November 1919, and Nora Williams in, in Clare uh, dragged out of her bed late at night uh, and hair cropped for company keeping uh, to late 1922. And it's interesting here that you mentioned uh, the violence in the north in, in, in um, Belfast, there is actually an upsurge in hair cropping uh, post-truce in the border counties uh, in spring 1922 to about late summer 1922, when it has stopped in other parts of the country. So it's very interesting that that violence continues then. The, ver the other very interesting thing about this data set, which kind of came as a bit of a surprise to me eventually when I was building it up, is the majority of the forcible hair cropping, the attacks at night on young women, is by Republicans, on younger women for company keeping. That's not to say the, the British authorities weren't attacking women and, and doing this sort of gendered violence, they were, but it's about 60-40 uh, when you look at, at the numbers. In 2000, Louise Ryan published her groundbreaking article, Drunken Tans, Representations of Sex and Violence in the, War of in in the anglo irish War which looked at the patterns of gendered and sexual violence during that period. Ryan, using newspaper reports, memoirs and diaries, details the many outrages against women in this period. Um, 
uh, during the War of Independence, including hair cropping, while Justin Stover writes that while an acknowledgement, uh, it has to be acknowledged that women who bore, bore the brunt of the raids and the interrogations and the reprisals, in 1920, there were over 50,000 <coughs> raids on homes during the War of Independence by the Crown Forces. This suggests that some of the most vital contributions to the independence movement took, play, took a place away from the ambush sites. And he acknowledges that the gendered narrative of the Irish Revolution involving sexual violence and rape seems to be firmly one-sided. So we'd have to see uh, that there were uh, both sides were at it. Here I want to note that the incidents of gendered and sexual violence in this period were neither unusual nor hidden. Reports appear in contemporary Irish newspapers, local, regional and national, in British and international newspapers, and as you will see, in some news media. These acts of violence, the public reporting of these acts and the common and widespread knowledge of them, of what was happening, served further to terrorise women and girls. Indeed, as James, oh, sorry, James Maloney of Bruff, County Limerick, he was in the IRA there, later, later noted, why they did it. This is an explanation as good as any as you can find, particularly for the IRA attacking girls for company <coughs> keeping. Some young girls created a problem. The British u uh, uniform was an attraction for them, as indeed with any uniform. They could be a danger to the movement and gave a bad example by consorting with the enemy. They were repeatedly <coughs> warned and stronger measures had to be resorted to. No volunteer liked the job, but on occasion these girls' hair had to be cut. It's very prosaic, it just, we, we had to do it. Among the most widely reported cases were those of Anne Devine and Bridget Keegan, both happening in Galway in 1920. In May 1920, it was reported that, and I quote, Miss Anne Devine was dragged from her bed by five armed and masked men, accused of keeping company with an RIC constable, and told that though they, the men, would make Irish girls have nothing to do with Ireland's sworn enemies. Her hair was cut off with a shears, with one man holding a cutting machine, uh, and completing the job. Her hair was cut almost to the skin. Equally under an, uh, an art, uh, um, uh, 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 Irish Times headline, the case of Bridget Keegan, five, uh, 15 armed and masked men took the, the girl who had fainted in her nightdress out into the yard and cut her hair off with the shears, telling her sister that that is what she got for going with Tommy's. While the men with the shears were cutting the hair, he sang, we're all out for Ireland free. Details of the Keegan and the uh, um, see, I seem to be going on. Details of the Keegan and Divine raid and subsequent arrests of the raiders and court and the court case on the Keegan case. Four men were arrested for it. Were widely reported uh, in the regional news, the Connacht Tribune, the Cork Examiner, the Irish Times, Freeman's Journal, Leitrim Observer, Mayo, Mayo News, the Skibbereen Eagle taking time off from watching the Tsar, mm -hmm. the Southern Star, the Tralee Liberator, the Londonderry Sentinel. However, it was all, they were also widely reported in Britain, as were many other cases of these sort of incidences. The Manchester Guardian reported that it is alleged that the girl who was taken out of bed, uh, forcibly placed in a chair and taken into the yard where two men held her while another clipped her with sheep shears. Her sister was said, was told this would hap happen because she was going with the Tommies. Indeed, this was reported as far away as Australia, where The Age, the newspaper in Melbourne, uh, included extra details, including the fact that the outrage was due to the fact that the girl's brother was a soldier in England. And again, uh, in common with what Kira was saying, all of this is about propaganda of the violence of the Irish against the Irish. You get very little reporting of black and tan violence on women. Uh, reported in the British newspapers. A little bit of, of outrages committed on properties in the Manchester Guardian, which can be a bit nuanced, but on the outrages against women, it's all of this, Sinn Féin outrages. Other reports of these sort of outrages um, include a Yorkshire Post report in October 1920, where it was noted that the Prime Minister, Lloyd George, in his Carnarvon speak in, uh, speech on Ireland included references to a particularly obnoxious form of minor outrage of cutting the hair of women's and girls. The number of these instances in this form now goes into the hundreds. The report mentioned a case of a domestic servant who while walking out with a private of the East Lancaster Regiment had her hair cut and tar thrown over her. The Sheffield Independent reported on hair cropping in, of a young woman in Newport in County Tipperary 
for walking out of with the soldier. And indeed, that case got all sorts of reporting because then the IRA, um, IRA attacked the local barracks and then the Black and Tans burnt down the local creamery. So it escalated into a lot of violence. And the Sheffield Evening Telegraph reported in January 1920 uh, of a warning that any girl seen in the company of soldiers or policemen would have their hair cut off. In December 1920, the Guardian reported that Ireland, under the influence of Sinn Féin, has decided that the cutting off of women's hair, the burning of barracks and the murdering of government servants was the road to Ireland's betterment. This, of course, was the RIC boycott, uh, which would include an awful lot of women who worked with the barracks. They were barrack servants. So these would be very poor working class women. Uh, it wasn't a well paid job, but it was steady. However, getting them to stop working in the barracks meant that the RIC men now had to do their own cooking, cleaning and looking after the place. So it formed a, a form of escalation of the boycott. And a lot of these barrack servants had their hair cut off in order to encourage them to give up their jobs. While this can be understood, the propaganda in the newspapers as anti-Republican hyperbole and propaganda, there is no doubt that the very visible cropping of their women was a part of the coercion and control and terror wide, used widespread by the IRA and used in Britain as part of Sinn Féin, anti-Sinn Féin propaganda. Throughout the War of Independence, the British press, press did have hundreds of these reports even if some outlets like the Manchester Guardian had provided a more nuanced coverage, they do occasionally report on the failings of the British authorities in Ireland and their policies. As well as a publication of these Sinn Féin outrages, as Kira has outlined, most of the uh, main British newsreels were distributed in Ireland. And um, I want to look at one particular newsreel in particular, is um, if we can play it. It is the British Pate. November 1920, uh, hair cropping. I don't know, have you already seen it today? Mm -hmm. You did, yeah. 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 You want to see it again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, one second. If it doesn't, if, since you've already seen it today, if it doesn't play, it's just the <laughs> For me, the most poignant part of it is the little smile. Mm -hmm. It just is, it just, I find it very difficult. So what happened and who was Mae Keneally and what happened to her? From the IRE, our RIC records, we know that uh, Mae was hair cropped by Republicans in November 1920 in Limerick City. She was on her way to mass when she was waylaid by men who took her into a field and cut off her hair, beat her about the face and knocked her down. It's a very prosaic way of she was probably brutally assaulted. And uh, as you can see from the hair, it's cropped. Look at the, the, the bits of skin showing through. I would imagine she bled a lot after the hair cropping because that's clumps of hair being pulled out. She would have been filmed soon after this incident happened and it is put on, on, um, on uh, newsreels. I would argue that the film itself is somewhat coercive. A description of it is a young woman she turns her hair, her head to show her hair. It has been cut very short. She smiles at the camera. A man lurks about in the shadows behind her. Uh, and this is what I find quite extraordinary, not just the representation of this sort of violence, which we now have on a, a contemporaneous newsreel, but also this young woman is, is obviously not doing it of her own volition. There is a man lurking behind her. I would, we would argue in, in, in modern parlance, this is re-traumatization that is going on here, but it is being used for propaganda purposes. However, in many ways, it's one of the few visual uh, pieces of evidence we do have of this type of gender violence. There's one other that I have seen contemporaneously. In September 1920, uh, over a 24 hour period, four young women were hair cropped in Galway City. Um, one in the morning by members of the IRA for giving evidence of, at a court of inquiry for the murder of Constable Crum, an RIC officer in Galway. Uh, her family were friendly with the RIC and he'd been in there. They had a hotel in Air Square. He'd been in their hotel earlier that day. And then later that evening, four 
coming among women, had their homes invaded and all four were taken out by armed and masked men, English accents, so obviously it was the black and tans, and had their hair cropped. One of them, Maggie Brodjick, her family, very well known Republicans, uh, had a camera and they took a photograph of her. And that photograph, if you go on to the Galway Museum uh, site, is on an exhibition on the War of Independence in Galway, <laughs> in Galway Museum, but it's also on their website, so you can have a look at it. It's very faded, but it's very similar, except Maggie Broderick being a coming and mon woman. And this is the difference, I think. The coming and mon women saw the hair cropping they got as part and parcel of the suffering they were doing for fighting for a Republican cause. It was always like, almost like the men accepting that they could be shot mm -hmm. and killed or injured in ambushes. For women like May Keneally, what is happening to them is about shaming and stigmatizing them and marking them out as women uh, with dubious moral, um, um, uh, dubious morals and, and potentially uh, treacherous potentially traitors to the cause of Ireland because who knows they might have been giving evidence although I'm sure someone like May Keneally didn't know anything to give to the RIC men. So this aspect of the war on women was used by as propaganda by both sides. In the July edition of the Irish Bulletin which was published as a daily newspaper funded by the All Air and most specifically by the Department of Propaganda one of the headlines reads the war on women and children. Am, am I for time? A few minutes ago. Okay. The author of the piece notes that, oh, I have to go back, I have to go back to my, yeah. The author of the piece notes that he wishes people to know the real nature of the war with which British Premier Lloyd George expresses his earnest desire to terminate. The, bu the bulletin was attempting to shock British and international readers into withdrawing support of the war and the terror tactics used by the Crown forces in Ireland, tactics with, which had the tacit support of the British government. Publication of the Irish Bu Bulletin began in November 1919 under the general editorship of Desmond Fitzgerald and for some months under that of Erskine Childers. Its main targets were opinion makers and so it was sent to pressmen, politicians, filmmen, influential public figures and the heads of churches in Britain and Ireland. And I wonder if the filming of May Keneally stemmed from this, uh, you know, trying to provide a counter propaganda to the amazing propaganda successes the Irish Bulletin uh, and the other Republican propaganda were having. Among the issues covered were the activities of Dáil Éireann, Republican courts, police and other elements of Republican propaganda, as well as increasing acts of aggression against the civilian population and in particular attacks on the most vulnerable members of that civilian population, women and children. As early as March 1920, Erskine Childers was describing in articles in the Daily Mail for a horrified English public the awful effects of these raids or home invasions had on women. In a series of articles published between March and May 1920 and reproduced in a pamphlet later that year entitled Military Rule in Ireland, he outlines this and he talks about a raid on the home of Una Barton, the wife of Robert Barton, mother, uh, or sorry, Una Brennan, the wife of Robert Brennan, and mother of the writer Maeve Brennan. Uh, Maeve would have been one of the babies who was in the house at the time of the raid. A raid, he said, begins with a thunder of knocks, no time to dress, even for a woman alone, or the door will crash in. On opening in charge, the soldiers literally charged with fixed bayonets and in full war kit, in many recent incidences, even the women occupants have been locked up under guard while their property was ransacked. Is it any wonder gross abuses occur? Looting, wanton destruction, brutal severity to women. In his articles, he uh, outlined the, the raids on the homes. This young mother's ordeal was the headline for Mrs. Brennan. Mrs. Brennan was roused by knocking on the door and running down in her nightdress, heard voices shouting, damn you, open the door or we'll smash it in. One soldier was drunk and used foul language. And in spite of her passionate supplication to be allowed uh, her children, she was kept apart under guard while the rooms were searched. And the search was conducted with the roughness and insu in insulin insolence worthy of the veritable home. This, he concludes, is not the marker of a civilized war. Robert Brennan, who was on the run, was actually hiding in a house nearby and couldn't actually do anything as he watched uh, his own home being raided. He said, I was ne I've never seen her so near a break. She was crying. 
They kept her downstairs all night away from the children and they had grilled her and our eldest child, Emer, age nine, for hours. The two younger children, Maeve, the, the writer, and Deirdre were hysterical, which was not to be wondered at. Uh, Una Brennan does suffer a miscarriage soon after this raid, so it just shows you the outcome of these. This was typical of the patterns of terror raids on how homes. And Childress is very clever here. He's including references to the Hun, kind of like that film in 1941, mm -hmm. the British become the Huns. Uh, in, in the German raids in Belgium, they had uh, called out the Huns or the Germans for attacks on little Belgium and a per particularly terrorizing women, which was, of course, one of the main propaganda tropes to encourage recruitment into the British Army in 1914. Propaganda at the time concentrated on how the Germans mistreated civilians in, in Belgium, specifically how they visited terror and outrage on the women. Here, per Childers presents propaganda evidence that the British soldiers were similarly mistreating Irish women. As Morris Walsh has said in his book on Irish propaganda during this period, the Irish Revolution was an international media event, some, in some degree a forerunner to the response to the Spanish Civil War just 15 years later, and we know how much that was uh, written about. Michael Hopkins does credit to journalists for undermining the British regime. However, Kira has argued that Perhaps a lot of this post-unionist framing was ignored by Irish audiences. The newsreads may not have been influential, as influential as the newspapers, but I, I would argue that piling one on the other and you get a huge propaganda war that's going on. And particularly the war on women trope creates a disquiet among viewership and readership in Britain and indeed in the US. Commissions were sent over, the Labour Commissions uh, in 1920 and 21, and the conditions in Ireland from the US, uh, and were fed back more on the violence against civilians and women to a horrified public. Britain did not, in the end, want to be compared to the Hun, whose atrocities against women they had used to propagandise recruitment. Pressure mounted to end these atrocities and did, in the end, I would argue, impact in some way, Not uh, there were lots of other reasons why, but did impact on bringing the British to the negotiation table. Thank you. I have two actually, I have one for each, but okay. Um, just, uh, but thank you both for great papers. And um, Kira, I was just wondering, in relation to the newsreel, um, the nuance of it, do you think that's lost? I can't really hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Kira, I was just wondering, do you think the nuance of the, the newsreels is lost on a modern audience? Because I noticed um, on the centenary of Bloody Sunday, British Cafe had posted about the, but they gave no context for for um, Crow Park, so I was just wondering, do you think it's been lost on modern audiences? And then Mary, I was just wondering, do you think that it, that sort of sexual violence and the hair cropping were a tool of war that was used from everybody, or was it just very much not really talked about? Because I know you said that a lot of the hair cropping was in the papers, but I noticed that maybe more serious sexual assault or violence mightn't have come to the force. So I'm just wondering, do you think it was a general tool or was it kind of just a few hundred incidences? So I think, and I don't want to be overly critical of British Pathé because they did a great thing in digitizing their collection um, many years ago and making it accessible online. Um, and of course, recently the IFI have taken some of those Irish newsreels and gone back to the original nitrate prints. So we have these gorgeous representations of them now where we can see details we couldn't see before. But when Pathé um, digitised their material, a lot of the, the, the stories about, um, the re you know, throughout Britain, stories throughout Britain are well contextualised, there's information that's correct, but when it came to Irish stories, some of the details are wrong, some of the cataloguing, it, there are errors. Newsreels were notorious for reusing material, so they used their own libraries and then they didn't always trace um, the changes over time. So you have periods that are um, listed as a certain year when they're actually not that year. You have politicians that are misnamed, um, misidentified. So there are loads of, of, of problems there. And I, I just think this is such a complex area that newsreel companies in, you know, in terms of documenting their collections were unable to keep up with the, um, the complexity of Irish politics. And even now, if you don't have a catalogue or who knows, about all of this, you're not going to get details on um, on all of these very intricate events and personalities. So 
I think partly that is lack of resources um, and also partly it was that Irish stories weren't deemed as important as, as kind of other regions. So um, yeah, that I think that context would be really important, but it's not always there. However, when it comes to Irish material, better to look at the Independence Film Collection than Pathé because there's much more context there, which is great. Thank you. Yeah, um, <coughs> it, it's very difficult to research the type of sexual violence or gendered and sexual mm -hmm. violence. Um, although in doing the research for the past couple of years, I, you know, I've been surprised at how much there actually is in the records. Yes, the majority of the events seem to be hair cropping, forcible hair cropping. But when you read deeper into them, it isn't just the hair cropping that's happening. There's always something else going on in almost all of them. Because, uh, but the, the, the language used is very interesting. Rape is rarely used as a word. What you get is indignity it was committed against me. I was insulted, uh, indecently handled, brutally handled. Uh, all of those sort of words. So you have to see that what is going on with a hair cropping incident. Now, not all of them. Sometimes they're just hair cropping and that happened. But in, in many of them, far too many of them, it's late at night, it's after midnight, it's 10 to 15 armed and masked men isolating a woman or a girl, usually between the ages of 16 and 22 or 3, they're usually in that age, usually single and married girls because they are company keeping within the house, but more, more commonly outside of the house, having dragged her out of a bed in her night attire. And what happens in the half hour, hour that she is gone is, I would argue, more than hair cropping because she comes back terrorized, brutalized, blood all over her nitrous, hair cropped off, scalp ripped open. And where they do talk about it, they say, uh, indecently or brutally or uh, other indignities committed. They use those terms. So the Irish War of Independence and, and actually the Civil War has more detail that they talk more openly about sexual violence and we have more uh, evidence of gang rapes by, by both National Army and um, um, anti-treaty Republicans happening. Uh, it, it wasn't a clean war there was a lot of sexual and sexualized violence. There was also the fear of it. Uh, May Keneally in the Irish Bull Bulletin talks about the fact that women knew that incidents of a sexual nature happen after the curfew hours. So they knew there was that knowledge that you didn't go certain places, you didn't go out after certain times. If those knocks came on the door late at night, the potential for sexualized violence was always there by both sides. Um, in many ways, the attacks by the black and tans, and there are a couple of, of court martials that happened about um, indecent sexual assault during raids on houses where the soldiers were actually tried by their own military. They get off with six months hard labor, you know. The other reason why we don't have much about it, women didn't talk about those things. I mean, it's difficult today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Women didn't talk then because it's shaming, stigmatizing, dishonoring you on the woman herself. But also the few that did go to the RIC stations to make the complaints are complaining to the Crown Forces about the Crown Forces. Uh, they're only really taking seriously if it's the IRA have done something. Um, so say, for example, Nora Healy in, in Cork, who was raped by an RIC man, went with her husband and makes a big long statement, which she gave to the Irish Bulletin, like they were seriously going to pursue, was told to go home. Nothing to be done here, that was it. So they knew they weren't going to get any justice. Yeah. Like um, even before the war, it was very, very hard to get justice in a, in a, in a conservative, uh, you know, patriarchal system um, it, during a war period where the authorities are those that the civilian population are supporting a war against. Interestingly, the Republican police seem to have taken some action against men, uh, particularly IRA men who were thought to be misbehaving but what they do a bit like the catholic church later on they just move them around they send them somewhere else thank you very much yeah i think we've time for one more question sure, i'll be very brief i just want um, to ask i know we're focused on a very specific part of irish history but in terms of the hair taking <coughs> and those um instances of violence 
do you see that continue later on in Irish history? And in the Troubles, yeah. Yes, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. It's so there is yeah. tarring, feathering and, and hair cropping during the Troubles, yeah. Right. Absolutely. It doesn't seem to be like, uh, they, talked they, about that much. Pardon? Or, I beg your pardon, it doesn't seem to be talked about Actually, uh, Teresa O'Keefe in UCC, you might know Teresa, she's mm -hmm. in sociology, writes about it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, a few people are beginning to write about yeah. it more. Uh, I think it is the young men are usually kneecapped uh, if they're, mm -hmm. you know, and the young women would be tarred and feathered, tight lampos. Um, and in terms of growing yeah. up in Northern Ireland, that would be part of our culture, we'd be aware of it. We would, you right. know, it yeah. would have been known. Okay. So it's interesting that that perception's not outside, you know? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, it is beginning to come into the, mm, sure. the narratives now. But in anything to do with women, it takes such a long time for those for an openness to develop around particularly traumatic histories and stories. Mm. I mean, it's taken a hundred years, really. It, mm. it started with Louise Ryan's 2000, which is 20 years ago, um, um, article. And now quite a number of us are working on this. And even like during the week, I got two or three emails from PhD students who are doing their, their, their PhD on this. So it's becoming mm. a, a, a widespread and widely researched topic, which is great uh, because it, it complicates the whole thing. Um, and I was at a panel um, in the Civil War conference in Cork on the Civil War politics, you know, uh, pro-treaty, anti-treaty, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael. And one of the comments I made at the end was that, yeah, Civil War politics divided the men. The one thing they united on was their attitude to women. Uh, and that was to keep women in the home, in the domestic. And, you know, we have to see how and why that happened. And this violence, particularly if you look at the uh, IRA and uh, pro-treaty, the, the free state violence against women, it shows an attitude that underpins the policies, misogynistic policies of the free state going forward. And, and it explains a lot mm. of what subsequently happened. All right, well, unfortunately, we're out of time there, but hopefully you'll stay around and if anybody has any questions, they can come to you. Sure. But thank you for some two really, really interesting talks. Incredible.